I thought if I was going to do a video on the viability of an unassisted bomb Torizo skip, then I should probably actually do one in a tool assisted speedrun or TAS. So here it is. There are roughly 31 frame perfect inputs required to pull this off. Even if you do all of these frame perfect inputs correctly, the game flips a coin at the end of it all to determine if it actually gives you the skip or not. Super Metroid likes to do that. If it lands tails, that means you remain stuck in the room because you started the maneuver on the wrong frame. Waiting one more frame before starting the whole maneuver would have resulted in success. The reason this coin flip happens is due to an implementation detail in how Super Metroid manages the timer that is used to trigger the close of the door after bombs are collected. When you enter the room, the timer starts at a value of 2 frames and counts down. When the timer is set to reach 0, it checks to see if the bombs are in inventory or not. If they are not, then the timer's value gets set back to 2. If you have collected the bombs, the counter gets set to 40 frames and starts counting down to door closure. What this means is that once you collect the bombs, you either get one or two extra frames before the game checks whether or not it should set the timer to 40. So the total number of frames you have to escape can be 41 or 42. We need 42 frames here. So far, no one has discovered a method to escape the room in 41 frames. In a real-time speedrun, there would be no way to tell which timer value you are getting on any particular attempt. So even if all the frame-perfect inputs could be done consistently, 50% of those otherwise perfect attempts would fail due to the coin flip alone. Now let us discuss a necessary technique if we want to pull this off. Arm pumping is a technique used in Super Metroid speedrunning and tassing in which every time the angle up or angle down button is pressed or released, Samus is moved forward one pixel. This allows Samus to cover more distance in the same amount of frames compared to running with no arm pumps. Out of the 31 frame perfect inputs, 28 of them are arm pumps as you dash toward the jump out of the room. You have to dash for a little under half a second in which you would press a shoulder button 14 times. Both the press of the arm pump and the release of the arm pump are frame perfect and in fact each of these 14 button presses must last for one frame and one frame only, no more, no less. This will be important later on. In this video, 30 hertz arm pumping means pressing a shoulder button 30 times in one second. It is the maximum rate at which you could ever meaningfully press a button, as the button needs to come down on one frame, up on the next frame, and so on. And the SNES outputs roughly 60 frames in one second, so if you want the state of a button to change every single frame like it needs to for this move, then you would need to be pressing the button at a rate of 30 times per second with little room for error. However, there are two shoulder buttons, and you could choose to utilize both of them to achieve the same effect. That is, you could alternate pressing the L and R buttons, giving you an extra finger to help you arm pump. Now each button only needs to be pressed at a rate of 15 times per second. This is still 30 hertz arm pumping, you just get two buttons to do it with. Pressing a button 30 times in one second using a single finger cannot be done. If you want to do the BT skip in real time, you will either need to use both shoulder buttons or find a more creative way to arm pump. Recently, a new creative method of arm pumping was found. It is called Zodan pumping, named after its creator, and we will discuss it later. When exiting the room, Samus will need to turn around while spin jumping as she goes through the door. This technique is called a wall check, and it engages the door transition earlier than if she had not turned around. The task method I showed at the beginning of the video is probably just the easiest way to do a task of the BT skip. If a person wanted to actually attempt this in real time with no tool assists, they would want a setup designed to minimize the chance of failure. While creating this video, I consulted with legendary Tasser Snick, and he came up with the method shown here, the semi-buffered BT setup. The collection of the bombs is very specific. It requires placement of Samus that is precise to within a specific range of subpixels, which is why there is a series of small hops from a normalized position up against the Bomb Torizo statue. The spin jump requires that the jump button be held down while standing, and a frame-perfect turnaround followed by a frame-perfect jump height. Collecting the bombs is frame perfect and you will want to press the start button one frame before pressing left, which is the input that actually triggers the bomb collection. After the bomb collection fanfare plays out, the game will start to fade to black since you queued up a pause. 
In between the collection of the bombs and the frame that the pause actually stops the game on, the only thing the player needs to focus on is 27 frames of perfect arm pumping. As the game is unpaused, hold jump and dash. This buffers a jump on the correct frame and you will then need to wall check the door. The wall check is very lenient with a 4 frame window. If the BT skip could be done as optimally as a task could do it, then the skip would save roughly 20 seconds in a speedrun, so it is no wonder people keep asking about this. However, with the exotic setup that would be required for a real-time attempt, it ends up saving roughly 12 seconds. Additionally, you will be leaving the room with zero missiles, whereas one is able to leave the Bomb Teresa room with full missiles if you defeat him and take the item drops he spawns. So additional farm will be required later in the run, eating further into the time save. To be clear, every top Super Metroid player currently agrees that this move is unviable in real time, and I agree with them. But in this study, I wanted to take the road less traveled in explaining why. In order to answer the question of whether or not this is viable in an RTA environment, we have to first acknowledge the differences between the TAS environment and the real-time attack or RTA environment. The inputs to a TAS are often done by a person with a controller, but that is just during the process of programming the TAS inputs. Once the inputs are programmed, they are fed to the emulator in real time, during which the person and the controller are not in use. So we can say that a TAS does not have a controller or a human in the loop. At least, not when we are watching the TAS play out in real time. In an RTA environment, however, there is a human in the loop, but also that controller as well. And both of these things have limitations and intricacies that emerge when being used in real time, which TAS avoids completely. I will let players that are actually good at video games tell you what a human can and cannot reasonably accomplish. Having said that, for the purposes of this video, let us assume it is in the realm of human capability and investigate whether or not there are any limitations in the hardware that will prevent us from doing it. But before we do that, I want to establish the scope of the question we are trying to answer. For us to say whether or not a BT skip can be done in real time, it is really only useful to assume that we mean under the kind of conditions that would be considered valid in a world record caliber speedrun. So no robots manipulating the controller, no tool assists of any kind. This is a human and a controller playing the game in real time. We are also only talking about the NTSC version of Super Metroid. Real time BT skip actually is possible in the PAL version of the game. So there is no need to include that in this discussion, as it is already a done deal. Since the PAL standard runs at a slower frame rate, the developers of Super Metroid increased Samus' run speed in the PAL version of the game to compensate. This means there is more room for error to do this move in PAL, although it is still a difficult move. We are also assuming that this is being done on real SNES hardware with an SNES or Super Famicom controller, with no special modifications of any kind. In general, an emulator would not help us here anyway for reasons I will highlight later. Original hardware is superior when attempting frame-perfect moves. However, this limitation of mine could be the weakest part of this video. For example, keyboard players are generally known for having great arm pumping capability, so my exclusion of the keyboard as a valid apparatus would be a valid point of criticism. In my defense, keyboards typically control an emulator through a USB interface, and we will discuss later why I do not think that is a good thing. Here's a thread by Muzu on the website Metroid 2002, which was an internet forum that was highly used by the Metroid community back before Twitch and Discord existed. This thread in question is dated May 16th, 2007. It appears to be the announcement of the first time anyone ever succeeded in performing a BT skip in an NTSC TAS. So we have known about this move for about 16 years, and in that time, to my knowledge, not one person has come forward and claimed that they have executed the move in a real-time environment. But could a person ever do it in the future? Well, as we will see in the course of this video, the RTA environment has a problem that TAS does not. To understand a little better what it means to input frame-perfect mashing in real time, we need to look deeper at how button presses on the controller get into the game. This is done by having the console pull the controller, and this oscilloscope shows us exactly what that looks like. I created a special cable that allows an oscilloscope to tap into the signals that are being transmitted between the console and the controller. Once per frame, the console asks the controller to report the states of all the buttons. Zooming out here, we see that each grid tick mark on the oscilloscope's x-axis represents 5 milliseconds. 
So we can see that the console is definitely pulling the controller once every 16 milliseconds or so, or one frame. That pink signal on the oscilloscope is the one that starts the pulling process and it goes high once per frame to pull the controller. The pace at which the controller responds is set by the yellow signal. It is a clock provided to the controller from the console. When the controller detects that the pink signal has gone high, it responds by locking the states of all the buttons, then reports them one by one in that blue signal. Each button has an assigned location in that signal. This chip on the controller's printed circuit board is called a shift register, and it is the thing that listens to the pink and yellow signals and generates the blue signal, effectively serializing the button states for transmission to the console. Once the console reads the button states, it uses that information to update the internal data in the game. This is things like the position of Samus and the enemies on the screen, their animation states, etc. Then the frame is drawn on a memory buffer which is in output on a video signal that connects to the screen. When creating a task, the transmission of inputs is managed so the polling is not usually a factor, although I imagine there may be some corner cases where that is not always true. In the RTA environment, however, that polling signal does matter, and this is one of the differences between TAS and RTA. So to understand how the polling of the controller has an impact in this case, we cannot just look at frames, we must look between the frames, and for lack of a better word, we are going to divide each frame into 16 segments of time and call each of those units a subframe. So for the purposes of this study, a subframe is just a fraction of a frame, and in this case, it is 1 16th. We are creating a special definition here for convenience only. I want to retain accuracy when describing events that happen on small timescales, but I would also like to avoid using too many numbers that have infinite decimal places, as I don't want to lose anyone in the math. The TAS and emulator development community uses the word subframe already to describe an emulator that pulls the controller multiple times within a single video frame. Since my second definition is also talking about when in the cycle of a video frame a button gets pressed, I hope I am not stepping on anyone's toes too hard by using a custom definition here, as it is in the same spirit as the existing definition. Flash warning for those that are sensitive to flashing, do not watch the next four minutes. I will let you know when it's safe. Okay, this is high-speed video of Super Metroid on an SNES console connected to a Sony BVM. This is what it looks like when a CRT TV refreshes when you slow it down. It is off screen, but I have modified a set of controllers to immediately illuminate a red LED when the item select button on the controller is pressed. The high speed video records at 960 frames per second. 60 times 16 is 960, so for every 16 images on the high speed video, you get one frame on the monitor. This is not exact as the SNES hardware actually runs at 60.0988 Hz but rounding will work for our purposes. This is why we have chosen 16 segments of time in each SNES frame to define as a subframe. That means that every image in the high speed video is one subframe. Using this terminology will help us not confuse the frames generated by the SNES at 60 Hz versus the frames generated by the high speed video at 960 Hz. It also just so happens that one subframe is very close to being one millisecond in duration, as each SNES frame is about 16.639 milliseconds long. We will define subframe 1 as that first millisecond after the screen refreshed. Well, as it turns out, screens do not refresh instantaneously, so technically, subframe 1 is the first millisecond after the screen starts to refresh with the new frame. The reason it is important to talk about subframes is because when we are talking about moves that have input requirements that operate on such small timescales, you have to consider that someone can press a button on any of the 16 subframes in a polling cycle, as this will come into play later. So that LED in the video can come on at any time in between the start of a new frame being drawn on the display, and it is more or less random which subframe the start of any given button press is going to land on. The only way to do any meaningful analysis on subframes is to collect a large sample size of button presses, then undergo a painstaking process of analyzing which button presses happen to land on subframe 1, which ones happen to land on subframe 2, and so on. Then you can check the video to see how many frames it took for that button press to actually get applied in the game. The original purpose of these high-speed videos was to measure the differences between input latency on different controllers some on original hardware and some on emulator over USB. 
When the console pulls the controller for button states, those button presses do not actually make it into the next frame that is drawn, as creating a frame is a bit of a pipeline process. They actually get applied on frame 2 or frame 3. If the button was pressed in the first 12 subframes, then the press will be applied two frames later. If the button was pressed in subframes 13 through 16, then the press will be applied three frames later. In other words, the controller is getting pulled on subframe 13. Now if you try to repeat these results, your mileage will vary as the results also depend on what you are using for a display and what kind of latency it has. Not even CRT TVs are perfect or even consistent in this regard. This is why advanced players might need to undergo a period in which they retune the timing of their inputs when using new or different hardware. During this latency study, I came to an interesting realization. Now it is well known that original hardware has the lowest latency out of any setup, with USB controllers having added latency. My results confirm this, but it is actually worse than just additional latency. USB controllers also introduce something I call ambiguous subframes. Let us say you have some way of ensuring that every time you press a button, it is being pressed on subframe 5. On original hardware, your input will always get applied on frame 2, but on a USB controller, it could get applied on frame 4 or frame 5, and you have absolutely no way of knowing or controlling which of these two frames your input will get applied on. In other words, USB controllers, from what I can tell, are not good for frame-perfect inputs. They introduce an element of randomness to your attempts. Okay, flashing warning is over. Original hardware has no ambiguous subframes whatsoever. I never encountered a single case where button presses on a particular subframe resulted in the application of that input inconsistently. This makes sense because the hardware's polling process is custom made for the job of transporting controller button states. It is lightning fast and efficient. The USB protocol is general purpose, and it sits in between the controller and the emulator, contributing to these effects. Out of all the controllers I tested, the best performing one that was not a stock wired controller was actually the 8-bit DOE SN30 2.4 GHz wireless controller. Its latency is almost as low as original hardware, and it only has 5 ambiguous subframes, which is not too bad. Every USB controller I tested introduced at least 2 additional frames of latency, and the vast majority of their subframes are ambiguous. This is why I'm limiting the study to original hardware only. If you cannot do it on original hardware, you will never be able to do it on anything else. But I will mention here again that I never included a keyboard in the latency testing to see if the performance is similar to that of a USB gamepad. Now that you know that we can capture subframe phenomena using high-speed video, let us take a look at doing just that when you press a shoulder button. Remember, we are limiting the scope of this study to standard hardware and vanilla Super Metroid. Arm pumping must be done on shoulder buttons and shoulder buttons only. The button remap feature of Super Metroid does not allow you to remap angle up or angle down to any button other than R or L. I modified a controller by exposing the L button's membrane. I then captured several button presses on high speed video. I pressed the button with different levels of force and on different parts of the button just to see the differences. For each button press, I analyzed the video to see just how long it took the button to get pressed and just how long it took the button to bounce back into the ready position. The original question I wanted to investigate when it comes to the hardware limitations of performing a real-time BT skip was whether or not it is practical for the button membranes to support single-frame button presses at 15Hz. I suspected that they could, but I wanted to see just how much of that button mashing cycle is consumed by just the travel of the button alone. After collating all the data, it turns out that yes, the controller does allow for 15Hz mashing, and at least 18% of the time of each mash will be consumed by the time it takes the button to be pressed and released. This 18% does not include the amount of time that the button is held down, just the travel down and the travel up. Now, one thing that caught my eye while analyzing this data is that the time it takes for the button to be pressed is not perfectly consistent. Even when you are trying to press the button in the same spot with the same force, as it turns out, video game controllers are not precision devices. They were not designed to be played as hard as speedrunners will try to push them sometimes. Button membranes have a tactile design to them. That means that they first resist being pressed so that a gentle glance of the button does not result in a press. Then they give way once a certain force threshold is reached. 
Sometimes the membrane seems to bunch up in a way that makes it more effective at the original resistance of the button travel, and sometimes it gives way faster. The way this manifests is that when you start pressing a button, it doesn't register until 4 subframes later most of the time, but it could be anywhere from 3 to 9 subframes. In other words, the travel of the button down to making contact and registering as a press is inconsistent at the subframe level. Even if you could command your fingers to press a button for exactly 16 subframes, the controller itself will inject some error into such attempts. Remember how I said I tried mashing on different parts of the button? You might think that hitting the button directly over the membrane, which is toward the outer edge of the shoulder button, would produce the most consistent results, but I actually found that hitting the button in the middle gave the fastest and most consistent results. I suspect that hitting the membrane in such a way that it angles its way in toward the circuit board is a good way for the tactile design of the membrane to break that initial resistance with decent consistency. So within my limited data set, the shoulder buttons would appear to have a sweet spot for the kind of thing we are interested in with this study. So I took many samples at that sweet spot and graphed their distribution, as it is the best example, and we'll get closest to what we can reasonably achieve. Here is a graph of the number of times I recorded shoulder presses at the sweet spot and how long each press took to complete. Even in the most consistent category of button presses, the consistency can be characterized by saying that most button presses will take 5 subframes plus or minus 2 subframes to complete. Most presses are clustered around 4 subframes in duration, and there are a few outliers as well. However, this kind of button pressing would probably not work well for fast arm pumping. I do not think I could press a button with this kind of motion and achieve a button press that lasts for only one frame. One would probably want to do something more like a flicking motion of the button, but my limited data set does not suggest that flicks are any more consistent than the case shown here. During the creation of this video, the player Zodin demonstrated a creative arm pumping strategy. Zodin strums the R button like a guitar, flicking the button with three fingernails with each pass. This strategy caught the eye of people interested in making the BT skip a reality when he was able to demonstrate 10 consecutive presses of perfect arm pumping. This is a remarkable result as it covers most of the distance to the needed number of 14 consecutive frame perfect arm pumps. These are truly 30 hertz arm pumps in real time with each frame alternating between pressed and released, and he does it using a single shoulder button. Zodin pumping is only practical in rooms that have very few inputs on the other buttons of the controller, since an entire hand is consumed by just arm pumping alone. In fact, Snick's setup for the BT skip can be characterized as a setup that caters to Zodin pumping, as the player is allowed to change to and from this grip in between the bomb collection fanfare and the buffered pause, eliminating the difficulty of mixing 30Hz arm pumping with other frame perfect inputs. This is exactly the kind of arm pumping strategy we would need to even begin a conversation about the viability of a real time BT skip, so Zodin pumping and Snick's buffer setup combined likely represent the single greatest advances to the prospect of this move in the last 16 years. I did a frame analysis on Zodin's pumping technique, and so far I would characterize it as not generally providing the kind of precision or performance we need to do a BT skip, but every now and then the stars do align and multiple frame perfect presses get registered in a row. If you are not an experienced speedrunner, I do not recommend attempting this technique as it is hazardous. Speedrunners push the limits of both controllers and bodies sometimes and are subject to injuries such as repetitive strain injury or RSI. So please game safely. Runners that have used this technique have reported that it is fatiguing to arm and shoulder muscles and cannot be sustained. So my excitement is measured. In an interesting coincidence, Zodin and myself have been tied on the Super Metroid Any% leaderboards for the last year and a half as we both halted our Any% grinds with the exact same personal best time. So it is perhaps poetic that we have intersected yet again as he was investigating the practical aspects of 30Hz arm pumping in real time while I was investigating the theory. Showcased here is the player Omnigazer, and he is known as being a great arm pumper. So these examples probably constitute something that is close to the current upper limit of arm pumps that alternate between L and R. However, Omnigazer speedruns on a keyboard, so if I or someone else were to ever expand the dataset of this study, researching keyboard and hitbox performance would be a great place to start. Recall that every single arm pump must be one and only one frame in duration. If one arm pump is missed, or if an arm pump is held for two frames, 
or if a press of the L and the R button overlap even once, the move will fail. When you are asking for that level of precision, then the characteristics of the hardware and the controller that we have been talking about need to be taken into consideration. They cannot be taken for granted anymore because the timescale that we're talking about is very small and weird things happen there, such as the discovery that button presses take a variable amount of time at the subframe level, and you cannot really do anything about it. If a person could ensure that every arm pump is held down for exactly 16 subframes, or the duration of one SNES frame, then you could ensure that every frame is getting pulled by the console with the button states you intend. However, as we have shown, button press durations cannot be consistent to that level of precision, not just because of human limitations either, but because the hardware is also imperfect. Also recall that as humans, we have no way of knowing when the controller is getting pulled by the console. We cannot normalize for it either. Unlike a task, we simply do not know what subframe we are pressing the button in. This is the crux of the problem, and I call it the polling phase problem. Let us contrive an example to demonstrate what can go wrong with inputs that need to be a single frame in duration. In these two graphs, we have 48 subframes representing three SNES frames. Controller pulling occurs on subframes 13, 29, and 45. We have aimed to press the shoulder button for exactly 16 subframes in duration, but we are going to apply the error bars we talked about earlier, and in the first case, the button was only pressed for 13 subframes, whereas in the second case, the button was pressed for 19 subframes. Remember that you cannot tell which subframe you start pressing a button in since it is happening too fast. That is what I call the polling phase, where in the polling cycle you start pressing the button. If you happen to start pressing each of these button presses on subframe 6 for example, then you are good to go. You will press a button for a single frame of duration because remember the controller gets pulled on subframe 13. Each press was long enough to have been held down during subframe 13, and each button press was released before the next time that the controller was pulled on subframe 29. However, if these button presses happen to fall on subframe 12, then we have a problem. In the first case, you will have pressed the button for a single frame because the button will get released on subframe 25, which is before the next pull occurs on subframe 29, but the second press gets released on subframe 31, which comes after the next pulling subframe on 29. Even though that second button press was held down for 19.7 milliseconds, which is pretty darn close to one frame of 16.6 milliseconds, the game does not know and does not care. As far as it is concerned, you held the button down for two full frames, because within that 19.7 millisecond window, you captured two pulls of the controller. Now imagine that these button presses occurred in subframe 14. Now it is the first press that is problematic because it gets released on subframe 27, which is before the next pulling subframe on 29. Even though that first button press was held down for 13.5 milliseconds, which is pretty darn close to one frame of 16.6 milliseconds, the game does not know and does not care. As far as it is concerned, you held the button down for zero full frames, because within that 13.5 millisecond window, you captured no pulls of the controller. You can try this last example for yourself if you like. If you develop a fast enough flick of a shoulder button, you can press the button so fast it never registers. It is difficult since these are extremely fast presses, plus you have to do it enough times to get a bad polling phase, if you will. In this video, for example, you should be seeing the R button pressed as denoted in the upper left corner of the screen for every time you hear a click. But sometimes an R press gets skipped. This happens when the button only makes electrical contact in between poles of the controller. But just to be absolutely positively sure that I was not making this up, I programmed an Arduino to output a signal pulse once per second, and the duration of each pulse is 13 subframes. I staggered the timing of the pulse a little bit to make sure that we get a different polling phase every time the pulse is sent. The Arduino connects to a relay which itself is connected to an SNES controller circuit board wired into the Y button. The controller connects to the console with the oscilloscope tapped in to show how the controller responds every time it gets pulled. You will notice that once per second the LED illuminates, the Y button's location on the oscilloscope blips, and the Y button registers briefly in the input display feature of the Super Metroid practice hack in the upper left hand corner of the screen. There will be a batch of inputs every now and then, where even though the LED does flicker, the oscilloscope shows no input and the game does not register a Y press. This happens when that 13 subframe pulse gets a bad polling phase and falls completely in between subsequent pulls of the controller. This is the polling phase problem in action. 
I then program the Arduino to output a 19 subframe pulse. Now the expected result is that every now and then the Y button will get registered as having been pressed for two frames instead of the usual one. It is a little harder to confirm this on real hardware, so for the next best thing, I hooked the controller into an emulator and recorded the inputs, while the 19 subframe button pulses were sent. I played back the movie and frame advanced one by one, and sure enough, every now and then the playback registered two frames in a row in which the Y button was pelled down. Again, this is happening because within that 19 subframe window of a button press, we got a bad polling phase and the controller was pulled twice. So these signals from the Arduino verify the polling charts from earlier. This is just how thin the needle is that we are trying to thread. When attempted in an RTA environment, 30 Hz arm pumping is not just frame perfect, it is more like subframe perfect. The polling phase problem injects an element of RNG to each single frame arm pump in the real-time environment, ensuring that the move cannot be done with great consistency, even if you could manage the press speed. There are many reasons why you would not want to devote your time to trying this move in an RTA environment. I suspect that most of them relate to human performance capability. But this is yet another preventative aspect that makes the move even more unviable than we probably would have guessed without the benefit of oscilloscopes and high-speed video analysis. It is not to say that a person could never do it under any circumstances whatsoever, of course. You can always beat the polling phase problem with additional attempts, looking for those attempts that give you a good polling phase. Perhaps someone does it once in some sort of astronomically lucky practice attempt. I definitely think such a thing is possible. But this event would be so special and unlikely that they should be awarded prize money if they ever do it, and they prove that there was no cheating involved. However, no one would ever do this move twice in a row, even if human performance capability were less of an issue. So no top player is going to commit to attempting this move just to give themselves a 1 in a 1000 shot at best. Recall that this move requires the player to commit to a setup which consumes time that would be unnecessary to expend if you just fight Bomb Terizo normally. So just try it is not much of an option as it is going to fail just about every time and you will have wasted the time you expended on the setup. Most of what is being presented here is understood by fellow nerds already and is not novel. But I thought I would compile some of these low-level considerations as an educational exercise to showcase how some of these effects manifest. If you have never heard of some of these concepts, you might be wondering why this is the first time it has popped up for you. After all, are there not other frame-perfect moves in Super Metroid? Well, sure, but the BT skip has characteristics that make it different from all the other frame-perfect moves. Usually, when we are talking about a frame-perfect move, we are talking about a button getting pressed on a specific frame, or released on a specific frame. I cannot think of too many other moves in Super Metroid Speedrunning in which we are talking about a single button needing to be both pressed and released on a specific frame, and those frames are in fact back to back. Inputs that are coming and going this fast will need to consider how controller pulling will impact them. That is the difference. But I think the timing of this video could not have been better. With exciting new techniques like Zodan Pump and gaining steam, it is possible that some people will want to attempt the BT skip using only a couple of save states. If they do, it is possible that they will run into consistency issues due to the polling phase problem. I could see one getting frustrated at hitting a limit and not being able to make their arm pumping more consistent beyond a certain plateau. The information in this video would let such a person know just what they are up against. It may also aid them in considering that perhaps their execution was not as bad as they thought it was, but they just got a bad polling phase and can blame it on that. But not even the creators and proponents of Zodan Pumping and Snick's semi-buffered BT setup believe that these new tools put the BT skip in the realm of human capability unassisted. They really just make the move go from very, very impossible to just very impossible. These are steps in the right direction, but the strides aren't large enough to close the gap yet. If there were a future discovery that somehow increased the margin for error, then we would get to reopen this discussion. But one thing that's for certain is that the circumstances that prevent the BT skip from being run viable are numerous and complicated, and hopefully the explanations in this video make it clear just how complicated the prospect of 30Hz arm pumping really is. I think this is one of the reasons why fans of Super Metroid continue to ask for this move. A simple question of, why don't you do this move, is far more loaded than they could have ever guessed. So feel free to link someone here the next time they ask the question, so they can learn more about just what it is they are actually asking for.